I just want to begin um, or start this evening's proceedings by welcoming everybody, lots of familiar faces, but also some new or newer ones. Um, I want to start by thanking Professor Lowy for his really generous gift of these, and you see the photograph in front of you, um, these rare first edition volumes of Sir William Jones's collected works. This is much appreciated um, as they fill an important gap, really, um, in the society's existing collection. And I'm certain that many users of our library moving forward will also value the opportunity, the rare opportunity, really, to consult them. And the timing of Professor Lowy's gift is also very fitting as it coincides with the start of the Society's Bicentenary. So 2023 has now come round eventually. We've been waiting for this moment for a long time. But it's a significant moment and milestone in the Society's institutional life. The Society has evolved a great deal from its early days, but it remains as dedicated as ever to investigating and sharing understanding, or understandings, I should say, about, as its founders put it, the sciences, literature and arts of Asia. And to mark this really important occasion, the donating of this very valuable gift to us and also the beginning of our 2023 um, anniversary year, we're delighted that Professor Javed Majid is here to talk to us about Sir William Jones and his contribution to scholarship. So thank you very much, Javed, for I'm coming and contributing to this. So I'm going to hand over to you and we'll all enjoy what you're going to tell us. Thank you. So, uh, evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak on this occasion of uh, Michael's generous gift to the society, um, the great addition to the library. Um, so I'll speak for about 30 to 35 minutes on the question of Sir William Jones's legacy. Um, and what I want to address quite broadly are some diametrically opposed perceptions of Jones's legacy um, and his contributions to uh, knowledge. Um, I'm not going to remind you of the key aspects of Jones's work because I'm sure you're all aware of these and there've been many studies and discussions and biographies of Jones since the pub publication of uh, his life writings and correspondence and by Lord Tainmouth, and also, of course, the 13 volume works of Sir William Jones edited by his wife. And so many people have, have analyzed his contributions to linguistics, law, history, literary studies, uh, poetry, romanticism, and so on. And I don't really want to repeat that here. But I just want to begin by saying there's some um, uh, kind of some preliminary remarks really about the difficulties of assessing Jones's contributions to a range of fields. Um, because as J James Turner pointed out in his uh, book, Philology, the Forgotten Origins of the Modern Humanities, by the mid 19th century, um, with the expansion of colleges and universities in Britain, the US and Western Europe, and the emergence of separate disciplines and subdivisions of teaching in academe, it was not really possible for a William Jones-like figure to move between languages like Persian, Arabic, Turkish, and Sanskrit, or to move across domains of knowledge like law, literature, and linguistics. Because these fields were not really clearly distinguished from each other, as you know, when Jones was writing. Um, and as you know, and also Oster Hamel in his 19, in his global history of the 19th century has kind of has traced the kind of the globalization of the idea of the university and how modern institutionalized forms of disciplines emerged in the 19th century. So we get the research university, we get the laboratory, we get the humanities sem seminar. So when we consider Jones's role in, uh, the, in the history of linguistics as well, we also have to remember that linguistics at the time that he was writing was very difficult. It's very, it was very difficult to separate linguistics from um, philosophy, rhetoric, logic, biology, poetics, religion. 
And so it becomes difficult to separate the field of linguistics from intellectual history in general in the late 18th century. And that also adds an issue to assessing uh, Jones's legacy. And there's one other point to be made here, which is as Turner puts it, our categories of knowledge today require a ripping apart of modes of knowledge and methods of acquiring it that were once connected. And those modes of method and methods, uh, those modes of knowledge and methods of acquiring knowledge were actually connected in Jones's writing. So there's a kind of sense in which when we return to Jones, we are reconnecting uh, with a pre-disciplinary mode of knowledge uh, while reading back into it ways, uh, uh, ways of knowing um, which are the kind of contours of current academic disciplines. And this kind of makes it quite difficult. And then I think one last point I want to make is many of us have experienced in recent decades the intensification of a tension between interdisciplinarity in the academy and the intensification of boundaries between uh, disciplines in the university. Uh, and I think we approach um, Jones today with those tensions in mind, the tension between interdisciplinarity and uh, the increasing patrol, patrolling, as I see it, of boundaries of discipline in the universities. So in a way, when we're reconnecting with Jones, we're kind of going back to an earlier form of interdisciplinarity, which is kind of being revived, but with new protocols, new technologies, uh, and, and, and so forth. So there's another, so I want to begin there. So those are just some general comments. And I want to begin with a key question, which has emerged in relation to Jones's contributions to linguistics and philology. As many, you know, you could say one of the most important ideas to emerge from British colonialism in India was the hypothesis of the Indo-European uh, family of languages, as, jo as articulated by Jones in his third anniversary discourse of 1786. And James Claxon, in his excellent book on Indo-European linguistics, has stressed that Indo-European is the best studied family language in the world. And for much of the past 200 years, more scholars have worked on the comparative philology of Indo-European uh, and the historical developments of Indo-European languages uh, than all other areas of linguistics put together. So the idea has had a considerable and long-lived impact. And also, uh, he points out quite rightly that leading figures in modern linguistics, such as Socio, Jacobson, and Bloomfield, were all Indo-Europeanists by training. So that's another, that's yet more evidence of how long lived that hypothesis of the Indo-European family of languages ha has been and the impact it's had on the academy. And also, uh, as Turner has argued, um, in many ways, philology, and he, and he gives Sir William Jones a pivotal role in uh, philology, uh, uh, was instrumental in the formation of the humanities in the 19th century or as he puts it, the birth of modern humanities in the English speaking world came from the womb of philology. And as I said, he uh, uh, credits Sir William Jones with a very important part uh, in uh, articulating what philology meant. Um, and uh, he also says that key philo philological texts like Schleicher's Compendium of the Comparative Grammar of the Indo-German Languages published in 1861, which was a key text, basically summed up, clarified, and elevated to a new stage, the Indo-European project sparked by Sir William Jones in 1786. So, um, uh, so just to be clear, philology then in the 19th century meant, referred to all studies of languages, as I, as I think you all know, and of texts, and it covered textual studies, uh, so textual philology, biblical, classical, and oriental, medieval and modern European languages. Also theories of the origins and nature of language and the comparative study of structures and historical evolution of languages and families of languages. So that's what it covered in the 19th century. Today, kind of philology has merged, has morphed into meaning more specifically historical linguistics. But in the 19th century, it had a much broader uh, the, the term had a much broader application. But the problem is that scholars like uh, Turner don't address the colonial context of Jones's uh, hypothesis and in which and the context in which it emerged. 
And for others, such as Siraj Ahmed in his book, Archaeology of Babel, the colonial context is crucial to assessing Jones's legacy and the legacy of what he calls colonial philology in the humanities. So this is a view which is quite different from Turner's. Um, for him, uh, for Siraj Ahmed in his book, Archaeology of Babel, Jones's colonial philology underpins the authority of text-based academic study today. And in his critiques of Jones, he argues that Jones's philological studies, under which he includes his 1771 grammar of Persian, his codification of Hindu and Muslim law, and his definition of the Indo-European family of languages, this precipitated uh, for him an epistemic transformation which defined the humanities, but it also underpinned colonial rule. That's his argument. In his view, the philological revolution that Jones initiated created a perfect method for both comparative scholars and colonial states. Jones's new philology became a global force, he argues, in comprehending every language and literary and legal tradition. He also argues it abstracted texts from a heterogeneous mass of manuscripts and discursive practices, and it led to the creation of historical knowledge in its modern sense. And finally, it enabled European scholars to acquire total historical knowledge by using non-European texts alongside European ones. So for him, basically, Jones is the villain of the piece uh, here. So that's basically where we are with Jones's studies. Uh, you have Turner on the one hand, and you have Siraj Ahmed on the other. And what I want to basically outline in the uh, rest of my talk is some ways of con considering Jones, which chart a middle course uh, behind uh, between those who condemn him and condemn him and wish to jettison him, in fact, and those who endorse him. I mean, and obviously the culture of wars are, are about the legacy of colonial knowledge uh, are, a, are a kind of context here. So, I, and then I'll end with some of the methodological problems which are involved in, um, uh, you know, assessing in moving forward with Jones, because I think there are some key methodological problems we have to uh, consider. And what I want to focus on is the creative messiness of Jones's work and the tension between a kind of destabilizing expansiveness and a countervailing attempt at containment and um, curtailment, uh, if you like. Um, between there's this kind of, there are these gestures towards systematization in Jones's work, but there are also the uh, the attempt to contain the destabilizing effects of the expo explosive nature of his work in terms of new materials, new languages, new literatures. So these te tensions, I think, complicate uh, his legacy. Legacy. So what I want to uh, focus on is something that people. Uh, you know, although it's been studied, has been kind of studied less than other aspects of Jones, which is Jones's strategies of transliteration. Um, and in particular, in his, uh, in his essay on the poetry of Eastern nations, 1772, written before he went to India. And then in his later essay in volume three of his works, after he was in India, called A Dissertation on the Orthography of Asiatic Words in Roman Letters. And I want to just talk about his approach to transliteration in the context of colonialism and its legacies. Because if one of the legacies of uh, British colonialism is the globalization of English as a language, this comes also with the globalization of the Roman script. And I want to talk a little bit about that, the globalization of the Roman script. How does the Roman script appear and work in Jones's schemes of transliteration? Uh, and you, I mean, if any of you have been to the subcontinent recently, we'll see how important Romanization has become. So you, 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 you see signs everywhere of kind of Romanized signs uh, of Hindi, Urdu, Kannada, Tamil. I mean, it's become a cup, you know, the Roman script has become a real presence in the, in the, pub, in the public realm. So on the one hand, in the, his dissertation on orthography, Jones sketches out an attempt to make the Roman script a kind of master code, as it were, into which other scripts can be transliterated. The essay aims, in his words, for a regular system 
of expressing other scripts in what he calls Roman characters. So that's the aim of the essay, a regular system to express other scripts in Roman characters. So you could read the essay in part as expanding and globalizing the Roman script. Uh, and he, there are many examples in this fascinating essay of concentration from Devanagari, Arabic, and Persian scripts into the Roman, uh, into Roman letters. But at the same time, there's another dimension to the essay, which I want to call attention to, which is that this attempt to make Roman, the Roman script a master script, as it were, produces its own ambiguities and instabilities. So first, in trying to transliterate three different scripts, Arabic, Persian, and the Devanagari script, into the Roman script, Jones becomes increasingly aware of how the letters of the Roman script represent different sounds in various languages of Europe. In other words, the Roman script becomes unstable as he's trying to transliterate into it. Hence, he decides to use the Italian equivalents for vowels and English equivalents for consonants. So basically, he has to use two different uh, uh, kind of subsystems of the Roman script. Italian vowels to render vowels, Italian equivalents for vowels, English consonants uh, for, for consonants. Uh, so uh, in a sense, you could say that what happens is that the, the variable nature of the Roman script becomes more evident as he tries to make it a master code uh, for transliteration. Uh, secondly, the, in his outline for a transliteration scheme, he begins with some comments on the confusion created by Greek trans, ancient Greek transliterations in antiquity of oriental names. So that in his words, if we have less liveliness of fancy than the ancients, we have more accuracy, more love of truth, and perhaps more solidity of judgment. And if our works shall afford less delight to those in respect of whom we shall be ancients, it may be said without presumption that we shall give them more correct information on the history and geography of the Eastern world. So note here, since we're discussing Jones's legacy, that he has an eye here on his own legacy and the legacy of his contemporaries and how he might be received in the future. And in doing so, he's measuring himself against the ancients and Greek antiquity and arguing that his trans forms of transliteration uh, represent, um, uh, are, are a real sign of progress on ancient forms of transliteration. Um, and it's worth noting, of course, that the Roman script became associated with progressive modernity more and more in the 19th and 20th, early 20th centuries. For example, we see that in C. E. Trevelyan's The Romanizing System of 1836, right down to the adoption of the Roman script for Turkish in November 1928. As you all probably know, the rewriting of Turkish in the Latin script was seen as a crucial sign of Turkey's commitment to modernize and to secularize. So, you know, as the 19th century wears on, the Roman script begins to acquire these very powerful uh, associations. And we see the beginnings of that, hints of that in Jones's essay, in the sense, in, by saying that basically what I'm doing here is a progress on what the ancients have done. But at the same time, again, and this is the, the, we always have these twin movements in Jones's essays. Every kind of gesture to power is accompanied by a, an increasing sense of inadequacy uh, and instability. So at the same time, uh, he miss, minces no words when he says that when he's trying to transliterate into the Roman script, he describes our English alphabet and orthography as disgracefully and almost ridiculously imperfect. And how impossible, he goes on to say, how impossible it is to express either Indian, Persian, or Arabian words in Roman ca characters, as we are absurdly taught to pronounce them in English. So, I mean, you have this essay, so clearly not an English nationalist move there. I mean, so you have this essay where not only is he aware of, does, does he become increasingly aware of the instability of the Roman script, the inadequacies of English orthography uh, uh, become more pronounced in the, as the essay moves on. So the more he tries to, so, you know, there's this other kind of narrative in the text 
where he highlights the inadequacies of English orthography. And I, uh, you know, the quote I've given given you, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a. He he denounces it in quite powerful, uh, criticizes it in quite powerful terms. Hence, um, you know, his decision to follow a Latin standardization for Romanization rather than an English one, because the great vowel shift separates modern orthography of English vowels from their original Roman-like pronunciation. So there's a problem here as when it comes to uh, English. Um, so put simply, in the essay, we have very explicit uh, uh, articulations of the inadequacy of English orthography. Um, and then furthermore, he says the Roman script can only become a master script for transliteration if it is supplemented with diacritics, notations, and what he calls fluxions. Only then, and he says, to quote him, it can equal the Devanagari itself in precision and clearness. So in other words, his attempts to transliterate into the Roman script actually elevate the Devanagari script as a mo model of clarity and precision, which the Roman script has to try to emulate. Uh, and that's just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that becomes evident in the essay. And in fact, the article follows the order of the Devanagari script, the order in which William Jones takes up the sounds as in the in narrative and presents them in the table follows the alphabetical order of Sanskrit. Okay, so you you so uh, I guess the the the, the point to um, make here is that as in the third anniversary discourse, classical European antiquity and its legacy are relativized. Just to sum up, so Greek transliterations of Oriental words have been a cause of confusion. Devanagari is the epitome of clarity and precision, just as in the third anniversary discourse, Sanskrit in his, is, in his words, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either. So rather than a confident expression of colonial mastery, the essay is marked by a very hesitant expansiveness of the Roman script and an increased awareness of its inadequacies in relation to Devanagari. Okay, so that's uh, uh, just you know some beginning points, some uh, starting points, some things I wanted to say about that essay. And the other thing I wanted to say here is that what about our reading experience of the, this essay as well as the essay uh, on the poetry of Eastern nations? Because I teach both essays in an MA class, and one of the I just want to say a few things about uh, about a few few other you know a, a little more about. Both essays. So in the appendix to the essay on orthography, Jones gives us transliterations, verbal translations of passages, sometimes the source text in the original script, sometimes not, sometimes he begins with transliteration and moves to the source text, sometimes the other way around. Um, and sometimes the source text appears in transliteration only. So my point here is that what we have here is not a smooth, linear, progressive reading experience. What we have is a kind of interrupted lin linearity, particularly as some of the scripts used in the essay read in the opposite direction from the Roman script. So quite literally, we have scripts coming at us in the essay from different directions. Uh, and in other words, we don't have a unidirectional Romanized transliteration as a mode of integration, a kind of colonial act of power of integration, what we actually experience are intersecting scripts, scripts coming at us from different directions and moving in different directions. So the essay reads more like a collage of scripts, an assemblage and just juxtaposition of different fonts and scripts stitched together through messy and experimental uh, transliteration. So there's no real clear linear um, unfolding of a masterly Roman script. And in, in some ways, you could read the essay as a kind of visual icon for the very messy forms of colonial power and its paradoxical effects in Jones's work. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's some other things I wanted to say here about uh, the essay, because the other thing, interesting thing about, but I'll be brief because I probably uh, 
uh, um, you know, haven't got that much time left. But the other interesting thing about the essay is that Jones also um, um, talks a lot in the essay about the whole apparatus of our speech organs, our tongues, our lungs, our breathing, and how that affects how we pronounce words. And I just want to mention that because what's interesting about the essay is also that the that there's a stress in the essay on our makeup as biological beings, as embodied beings. And in this, we in the essay, therefore, we see glimmerings of linguistics as a physical science as well. Uh, not just an abstract uh, science, uh, not just concerned with abstractions of classification, but also the glimmerings of it as a physical science. And as is well known, Jones had an interest in botany and the Linnean taxonomy um, informed his approach to classifying languages. So what we see in Jones's essay and in his work as a whole is a kind of, not yet a clash, but what is going to be a clash between linguistics as a physical science and uh, linguistics as a subject in the humanities. But we get both in Jones, uh, kind of concerned with uh, us as biological beings whose speech organs, whose biological makeup enables us to utter sounds of different kinds, as well as kind of abstract classification. Uh, classifications of uh, of letters and sounds. Um, uh, so, you know, historians of linguistics um, uh, have kind of shown that in the 19th century, more and more linguists tried to strove to place linguistics in the physical sciences. So Schlegel, Rask, Schleicher, and, and others insisted on a close analogy between linguistics and biology. So this, this essay also, and William Jones's work, also needs to be read in the light of these later developments uh, in, and what was later to become a clash between linguistics as a science and linguistic as a text-based humanity subject. And in some ways, it's so refreshing to see both strands in Jones's work because uh, currently in uh, academe, a dialogue between formal linguistics rooted in science and social science, humanities, linguistics has become well nigh impossible. So uh, it's kind of quite nice to return to, to Jones's essay. So just to, um, uh, I, I won't, uh, uh, you know, say, there's a, I wanted to say a little bit more about transliteration in the earlier essay on the poetry of Eastern nations where we have a similar kind of visual experimentation and visual experience with different uh, uh, scripts. Um, but what I would want to say is that um, what I found interesting in uh, teaching this earlier essay is that for those who don't read the scripts that Jones reproduces in the essays, um, those scripts tend to dominate the page more for those who, who don't read it. So I found with students, that the passages in the non-Roman scripts tend to dominate the essay for students who don't know those scripts. So the, in a sense, the essay dramatizes less the unabashed power of a colonial script and a clear sense of a historic mission to globalize uh, uh, the Roman script and more its uncertainties and provisional nature which paradoxically highlights the singularity and distinctiveness and power of non-Roman scripts. So that, that, that's uh, what I wanted to uh, say there. But of course, the other thing about the earlier essay on the poetry of Eastern nations is uh, we have again this kind of uh, combination of expansiveness and curtailment of kind of a, a sense of inadequacy which becomes, as it were, magnified to the essay's expansiveness. So you have this kind of com combination in the essay. So on the one hand, in praising Asian poetry, Jones is very cagey in the poetry on Eastern nations about not wanting to quote him, to derogate from the merit of the Greek and Latin poems. But on the other hand, his translational encounter with Asian poetry also highlights for him the staleness of European po poetry, which needs to be rejuvenated with an account through an encounter with Asian literature. So as in the dissertation on orthography, the themes of the legacy of classical antiquity in the presence, the question of his own legacy and that of his contemporaries um, for future generations 
and a heightened sense of cultural and creative inadequacy are entangled with each other. So you get the, this mixture in his, in, in, in his essay of inadequacy alongside expansiveness, and the two seem to be related to each other in most of in, in, in his work, as far as I can see. So um, I, 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 I probably, maybe another five minutes, is that okay? If I, yep, another five, maybe seven minutes. <laughs> not very good academic, uh, academics aren't good at keeping time, but anyway. Um, so, um, uh, so I want to talk uh, just about one other legacy of Jones, and that is his archivizing impulses. Uh, because there's been a lot of work done on co the colonial archive. How do we read it? How do we encounter it? How do we negotiate it? And as Kenneth um, Kennedy pointed out in his very clear-sighted 1994 essay on Jones's uh, legacy, among jo William Jones's and the Asiatic Society's legacy was its library, its collection of manuscripts, printed books, its museum uh, with a collection of zoological and geological specimens. And what we can see therefore in Jones is colonial archivization as a process and a principle, a way of containing quite literally the destabilizing effects of the knowledge explosion that we find in his work by housing its items, its objects, its texts in buildings and libraries dedicated to cataloging and preserving them. And in the last two decades, there's been a, a lot of work on the colonial archive, as I said, and how we approach it. And in addition, Jonathan Lawrence has written an important article on jo Sir William Jones's manuscript collection, um, the methods of collecting manuscripts, methods of collecting manuscripts, the networks he relied on, and Gillian Everson, who studied Jones's Sanskrit manuscripts in the Bodleian Library, also considers the archivizing impulses of collectors like Jones and how it illuminates his life, thought, and scholarship. So what we see basically, what I want to just say here is what we see in Jones's work as a whole are hints of the colonial archive in the making as an idea, an institution, a process, and an accumulation of physical objects. The archive is, bec is becoming a material reality in Jones's work. And this is uh, obviously evoked in his third anniversary discourse of 1786, which lists four general media to study Indian history. Um, and to some extent, the Asiatic Society, which Jones set up, was an archivizing institution, primarily uh, in all kinds of ways. And the museum was a clearinghouse for investigation in the 19th and 20th centuries. And it, the Society's museum became part of a uh, a worldwide kind of network of museums. Uh, 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 you know, and I, I won't kind of dwell too much on that. But what I want to um, just kind of, uh, I just want to discuss a few things here about Jones and the archive, is Mbebe has called attention to how archives assemble pieces of time, uh, what he calls the community of time, the feeling according to which we all are heirs to a time which, over which we might exercise the rights of collective ownership. And Jones is uh, uh, underlying the idea of the archive is the aim to order the past as an inheritance to systematize its chaos. And this archivizing impulse is therefore strongly ground up with Jones's attempt to reconstruct Indian history and the later impact this had on Indian nationalists. But it is also bound up with his narrative of the monogenesis of humankind and its languages in the third anniversary discourse of 1786. As you know, in that discourse, when he talked about the affinity between Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit, he was led to speculate on the possible monogenesis of languages and uh, humankind. So um, that is in his archivizing impulses, Jones is already raising questions about legacy and, and inheritance. On the one hand, in reconstructing Indian history, uh, which was to be appropriated in different ways by Indian nationalists from different ideological backgrounds, it was appropriated as their specific inheritance. On the other hand, for Jones, this was also part of a global story of humankind in which the possible monogenesis of humankind figured largely. largely as Kennedy has stressed, 
some of one of Jones's legacy is legacies is a vision of the unity of humankind and a faith that scientific research will reveal our biological, cultural, and linguistic affinities with each other. So in Jones's archivizing impulses, we already have different pos possibilities for different kinds of collective ownership of the past. Complex narratives of inheritance and legacy are opened up, which we continue to grapple with today. To put it you know, simply and perhaps crudely, is Sanskrit the exclusive cultural inheritance of Hindu nationalists, or is it a global inheritance, part of the global story of the monogenesis of the Indo-European family of languages and perhaps of all languages? So we already have these questions in the archivizing impulses uh, of Jones. And the other uh, uh, thing maybe to think about here is Suzanne Van Zell has argued that um, the thing about archives is that archives don't just archive the past, they're also future oriented. They are, they are kind of unstable sites which exist in a ambiguous relationship to time. And the archive, as it were, has a future oriented structure. And we have this kind of sense of a future oriented structure in the, and possible future recastings uh, in Jones's own uh, archivizing uh, and his own kind of self-reflections on his possible future legacies in his essays. So he o o often has an eye on his future legacy. So I think this is a good point to end, uh, don't worry, I'm ending soon, with some con concluding thoughts on Jones's future legacies and how it can be mapped in the sometimes rather heated debates on the legacies of colonialism in Britain and in Asia. I'm now too old to get uptight about those debates, but anyway. Um, and particularly the role, uh, you know, Jones's role in colonial thought. Um, and I want to focus on the question of assessing the legacy of Jones's role in Indo-European linguistics. And I just want to make two points here. The first is a number of scholars have shown that connections among Indo-European languages and between Sanskrit and other languages uh, in the family were observed by many before Sir William Jones. So many before Sir William Jones had observed these connections. And that in fact, the 1786 presidential address didn't mention much, that doesn't mention much that is original. And had it not been for the later work of Schlegel and Schleicher, nothing would have, maybe nothing would have come out of his incidental remarks. So what, it's worth noting here, therefore, that both the defenders of Jones and those who attack him exaggerate William Jones's role in the history of linguistics. And this leads me to my second point when we need to consider the legacy of Jones and Siraj Ahmed's argument about colonial philology and its relationship to uh, philology as always having a colonial relationship uh, to India. And the, the second point I want to make is that uh, both defenders of Jones and his critics, uh, well, his critics in particular, tend to ignore the fact that the most significant developments in philology in the 19th century took place in German universities, not in British universities. English speaking scholars drew on German writing and personal context contacts, particularly from the 1830s onwards. And before the 1840s, the philological revolution critics of Jones credit him with initiating was not really properly noticed in the English speaking world. Since that is the case, it becomes difficult to posit confidently concrete links between philology as a whole and colonialism in India since Germany led the way in philological studies as a discipline in the 19th century, and it had no direct colonial links with India as a colonial power. So those who, in other words, we need to uh, you know, think about uh, that kind of quirk in the argument about the relationship between philology and colonialism, uh, you know, as I, as I said. So, uh, both Jones's defenders and his critics share this misplaced view of William Jones's role in the history of linguistics, but they also tend to underplay the really important role that Germany played in the development of philology, mm -hmm. as opposed to Britain. In other words, if philology so was so instrumental for colonial rule, why was Germany the place where it developed uh, 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 really quite spectacularly and not, not in Britain? 
So um, that's, uh, 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 you know, and then I just want to end with one uh, last point. It's worth stressing, as Chris Bailey pointed out, that Jones and his, and his contemporaries were more invested in a mastery of effective knowledge, which was an early concern of the British state in India, mm -hmm. and that this just diminished as the 19th century wore on because you got kind of more hierarchical and routinized styles of knowledge and governance. governance. So this could lead us to consider more carefully, to borrow a phrase from Stoller, um, I, about the, which is what I've been touching on here, the emotional economy of the archive in William Jones. Um, what she calls mixtures of abstract reasoning, impassionate pleas, personal experience, and disparate understandings in the in this emotional economy. And I've kind of touched on that in the, 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 this mixture in Jones's writings. Um, and this kind of mixture is evident in the shifting coordinates in William J Jones's text between mosaic chronology, in other words, biblical narrative, the legacy of Greco-Roman antiquity and the Indo-European hy hypothesis. So you get these shifting co coordinates between the Indo-European legacy and its implications, Greco-Roman antiquity and biblical narratives and the mosaic chronology. And it's like he's there's this kind of triangular relationship that Jones is continually uh, negotiating. Now, the, the tensions uh, uh, in William Jones's religious syncretism have been discussed by Feroz Vasunia and Alan David. But I think an intense, uh, by uh, attending to these shifts and tensions, particularly between biblical narratives and the secularized historicity of the Indo-European family of languages, would also help us to assess Sir William Jones's legacy in terms of the history of secularism, both in Britain and in India. But that is another story, so I'll leave it there. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Yes, for such a careful, nuanced, but obviously thought-provoking um, exploration. And when you got towards the end of it and you brought in effective and you know emotional economies, I mean, I was just... You know, Oh, I'm so excited by what you had to say. So I don't know if there are questions. I just, we have a, a short amount of time for questions. I can see hands going up. I saw Derek going first and then Mike over there. So if you want to kick off. Thank you very much. I'm fascinated. Uh, there's uh, a lot of evidence that Things in particular in it uh, was uh, the notion that uh, is somehow captured as a local physical work. Because uh, that doesn't really begin when language is in civilization in Asia. That was uh, denied in Victorian times. Uh, 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 the later period, uh, the same uh, European factory came into view uh, in Victoria. My money, uh, India was never a colony. There was a partnership. Um, Canterbury uh, has been set up. Yeah. So everyone's still um, having it. So I actually feel this is quite a different framework. Perhaps, perhaps you also. Well, oh, thank you. That that's interesting, particularly about the um, that actually puts um, maybe uh, yeah gives us another framework to think about the legacy of Jones. That maybe this tension between you know his his kind of apologetic tone about relativizing Greco-Roman literature and uh, antiquity and culture by dealing with Asian literature and Sanskrit and Sanskrit being more perfect, more copious, etc needs to be also seen in the light of this shift to 
thinking about the origins of mainland Greek culture, Black Athena, et cetera. And I never thought of it like that. That's a really, that's a really uh, interesting, um, interesting possibility, I think. Yeah. No, thank, thank you for, for, for raising that. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, no, maybe that's other. Uh, if you want to. No, no, that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, I, I was going to bring up a different point. You, you mentioned the names that possibly affect the passage on Sawyer. And uh, the names was fairly strongly influenced by his religious view. He was. Um, but I wonder, so you haven't mentioned religion at all in terms of relative I, I wonder to what extent you know, religion in some of his books. Yeah, so that uh, I mean, I that's why I ended talking about the mosaic chronology, yeah. and uh, because in in that anniversary discourse. What's fascinating about it is on the one hand, you have this new historicity, which you could say is a secular historicity of the family, Indo-European family of languages. But on the other hand, there's this attempt to reconcile um, uh, this, uh, there's a tension between this and his adherence to the mosaic chronology. Um, and that's that's very clear. And I kind of slight, how, how Alan Davis and, Perez Vasunia have, have uh, interpreted it is by saying that actually, uh, uh, actually I've, I've written it down <laughs> somewhere, which is that that basically um, Jones was, they don't, they see Jones as not, as declaring his faith in, in biblical history to give him um, more space within um, the broadest bounds of orthodoxy for, I mean, I'm just reading from Versunia, for, for speculative activities corrosive of traditional authority. So some commentators see Jones as, as it were, paying lip service in order to undermine uh, biblical authority. But actually, I don't see it like that. I have tend to agree with you. I think that what we see here is a genuine crisis of faith. I don't think he's paying lip, lip service. I think he's struggling with a tension between inherited biblical narratives and their view of the genesis of humankind and the dispersion of nations across the globe and the view of history in the first five books of the Bible and what the Indo-European, the problems for that narrative that the Indo-European family of languages is positing. So I, I tend to see a kind of struggle with a crisis of faith rather than a a kind of disingenuous paying lip service in order to make radical points about undermining biblical orthodoxy. So that that actually is my my view. Uh, we're on the same uh, singing from the same hymn sheet, as it were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I follow on direct. people. Think within the thinking systems they inherit. I mean, Julian Beer is very good on Darwin. Right. I mean, Darwin using the show. Sure. And, and another thought that's the future protection what determines mm -hmm. and what do these librarians and architects know to to the for the future? So the reason I think by all of this volatile fiction is a lot of different 
Right. And, and so what the influence on basically sort of right. I mean it, it, it also highly political and that all has a various yeah but also i think it's the archive is unpredictable i mean i think it i think the what people find and how they read it uh is can, can kind of change from epoch to a epoch even if and they're reading the the same text and also i mean one thing we haven't talked about is uh the digitization of archives i think that is also going to alter the future recasting of colonial archives quite substantially uh, what when you say what when it's not just what librarians choose but it's also what they choose to digitize and what they choose not to digitize and why they make those choices and on what basis they make those choices feeds directly into the question of the legacy of the archive uh, so which is so yeah that's right yeah i mean because you you know, if you, you if you don't have to travel to the India Office Library, or I know it's not called something else now, but I still call it the India Office Library anyway. You, you know, to, to physically to consult the archive, you you know, you are operating with a, a different sense of accessibility, and also, I I would argue the but I, the reason I stress the materiality of the archive is because I think the digitization of the archive dematerializes the archive, and I think. When you engage with an archive digitally, it's a very different experience from engaging with the archive as uh, manuscripts, books, documents, as physical objects. And not enough work has been kind of done on that, uh, I think. Because I think the physicality of the object affects also how you read it, how you handle it. And it's a tactile experience in a way in which it's a, you know, the three dimensionality of the book or the document is it has something to say about power in a way in which if you see it just on a computer screen, you, you know, that dimension can be lost. Yeah. I wonder if you were to look back at the archive and the archive that you I don't have any problem what being an update to the original. If you think it's a good we have only one and it's a burned Oh, and this must be in. When you think that Australian supermarket
Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, that's right. I know, but also, I would say, I, I mean, I'm completely in agreement with you in my, um, you know, my, my sorry to mention this, but in my first, first book, I do talk about the impact of the common law tradition on Jones's approach to law in India. Um, um, and yes, that you definitely we need to think his curate, think about his curating practices in terms of what is happening in Britain in terms of curating practices and archivizing the, the, the past. But also I think what's interesting about the late 18th and early 19th centuries is that this was also a, 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 um, you know, a period of, um, uh, you know, in many ways, Britain was also a conflict ridden society. And there were all lot, you know, there were con ideological contests, political contests, contests, um, you know, the movement for uh, electoral reform. And in fact, William Jones' Principles of Government, uh, 1784, was a radical political text. And so um, I think when we think about his background, we need to think about the uh, different tensions and conflicts within British society, which he was also negotiating. Uh, and in particular here, I think that, that his political views are interesting because his principles of government, 1784, uh, are very much, um, you know, written to argue for political reform in, 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 in Britain. But he argues that the democratic system is not applicable to India. So in some ways, the, the those what's happening in Britain also illuminates the contradictions in Jones as he becomes a global figure. And I think that's the uh, uh, issue here. To what extent is Jones a British figure? To what extent is he an Indian figure? To what extent is he a global figure? And how do the three kind of gel with each other, if at all, becomes a question. Because there's a sense in which his legacy has different trajectories. And I think while we need to deal with him as a whole, we shouldn't make him into a kind of, we shouldn't try and make what he produced monolithic. I think that that's how I would respond to that. Thanks. That was the last question, and that was a really, I think, appropriate point to end. Thanks for being the not to over. Very complex. So just to say again, thank you very much thank you. for speaking to us, coming and sharing your knowledge. Thank thank you. You. I think there's some